This episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Whether it's espresso machines, manual brewing devices, or general coffee shop needs, they seek to pursue the most innovative coffee products, both domestic and abroad, to offer their customers. Find out more at prima-coffee.com. This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. Today, we're talking with Joshua Boyt, owner of Metronome Coffee in Tacoma, Washington. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I'm your host, and I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and that you're recuperating today. Um, maybe you got up early and got some of those Black Friday deals. I always try to avoid that stuff. But uh, anyway, I hope your uh, Friday is going really well. Today is Founder Friday. And what that is, if you're new to the show, is at the end of the month, on every last Friday of the month, we interview an entrepreneur, a founder, owner of a retail coffee business, and talk to them about all that they've experienced and learned from the beginnings of their stepping into coffee till today. And it's always really instructive, inspirational, educational, And that is exactly what today's interview holds. And before we get started in there, I want to thank our sponsor, Keys to the Shop, Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is a specialty coffee equipment supplier, and they're based out of here in Louisville, Kentucky. And from the beginning of their business, they've set out to make the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public. And their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need from grinders to espresso machines, undercounter fridges. They carry a wide range of items and equipment for you to use. And when I say curate, I really do mean that. We had Steve Reinhardt of Prima Coffee on the show, and that was on uh, episode 42, Supplying and Selecting Equipment. And uh, that was really great. And it shows you all that goes on behind the scenes at Prima Coffee before it ever, before an item ever makes it to their website. So if you go to prima-coffee.com, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's a lot of resources just uh, beyond what you see on the page. There's a lot of instructional videos and uh, materials that you can use to better understand these items. They put a big emphasis on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. And uh, again, I highly encourage you to check out prima-coffee.com. And depending on when you're listening to this, um, um, they have a lot of Black Friday sales going on. So definitely check that out. Won't last long. Again, that's prima-coffee.com. And my thanks to Prima for your support of Keys to the Shop and also supporting the industry with providing us the tools we need to do our jobs well. So today we are going to be talking with Joshua Boyd, who is the owner and founder of Metronome Coffee in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, Joshua is a 16-year industry veteran, and a large portion of that time was uh, spent at Dolano's, where he was mentored directly under Lon Laflame and David Morris. And ever since then, it has just opened the door to explore his growing passion for coffee. He's traveled the world countless times, supporting and developing businesses, uh, all the way from one location to 100 location chains. And in addition to that, he has worked over 30 trade shows with Coffee Fest, uh, running their international latte art competition for over five years. Joshua is a published author in numerous international trade publications, as well as uh, an amazing speaker, just drawing rave reviews from his seminars on coffee passion, precision, and potential and emceeing many world and national barista competitions. After leaving Delano's, Joshua founded Metronome Coffee. And Metronome has just been an award-winning coffee shop since it opened, and it was also featured in the CNBC special, The Coffee Addiction, with industry giants Starbucks and Intelligentsia. And most recently, in 2015, Joshua founded a business and brand development consulting firm called Tuning Fork Consulting, and is helping many small and large business owners create and refine their mission, their vision and values, and translate them into a successful business. So in addition to all that, Joshua has also held the position of Northwest Regional Chair for the Barista Guild of America from 2010 till 2012, and is currently on the editorial advisory board for Barista Magazine. 
So here's a guy who just has a ton of uh, wisdom and experience and uh, lots of stuff to share with us today. And in our interview with him, he just really gets to the heart of what drives him in business, what makes his businesses tick, what makes him tick, uh, all the things that he has learned over the years. I feel like all of the experiences and energy and and purpose that he has developed over the last 16 years in his career has just been focused into the confines of this uh, small conversation. So I know you're going to be energized after this. I certainly was. So let me take you to my conversation with the owner of Metronome Coffee, Joshua Boyt. Well, hello there, Joshua Boyt. Welcome to Keys to the Shop. Hey, Chris, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing? You know, pretty darn good. (laughs) Well, I'm glad to uh, get to talk to you. Uh, You and I have known each other for for quite a while, and um, Mm -hmm. I've always been impressed with all that you've got going on, your work ethic, um, Mm -hmm. all that you've contributed to the industry. It seems like you're you're always traveling, you're always emceeing, you're always starting something. <laughs> and I'm I'm really excited to dive into your career a little bit here uh, for it. this Founder Friday episode. So I, I wonder if you could just take us back to the time when you first got into coffee. Like, how did you end up starting yeah. <laughs> into this industry? Oh, it was amazing. So there I was with these goats and uh, it was just, I was just hurting them and they started eating these bears. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> Um, uh, it was, uh, <laughs> no, um, back in uh, 2001, I started actually as a, believe it or not, a delivery driver for, uh, the uh, largest espresso supply distribution company in the North was called, it was called, uh, um, atomic distributing. Hmm. And, um, I it was kind of just by happenstance, never really thought coffee or anything like that, but just, uh, somebody approached me with a job opportunity and it was somebody that I happened to go to church with or something at the time. And they um, and I and I started working there and um, kind of within the first couple months of, of doing that job, went to my first coffee fest and saw this like whole world of coffee and was kind of enamored with the whole deal from the get go. So um, then now and I'm still in it. <laughs> <laughs> what, 16 years later? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty wild. Yeah, I can't. It's hard to believe. Um, it's been that long because I obviously never was as a kid growing up, like, Oh, career in coffee. That's obviously what I'm going to do. You know, it was, you know, you know, astronaut and veterinarian, all the usual things, you know? Yeah. Um, none none but, of the coffee shop owners showed up on career day, right? Yeah. It's, it was so wild, you know, but funny thing about it, um, weird story. My, so growing up, I grew up in, in, uh, in Buckley, um, Wilkeson area, um, over towards the foothills of Mount Rainier. And, um, there was a little small building on the side of this convenience store in Buckley, um, that my dad helped to build for a guy that, um, that went to our church and he used to go over across the mountains and, um, buy, um, produce and sell it there called uncle Tim's fruit stand. Anyways, uh, fast forward years later to when I'm in high school and that was the original, uh, location, uh, where Delano started, which is my first, um, my first uh, foray into working with a roasting company. So mm. my dad in some weird way built the original, you know, helped build the original Delano's location, which kind of got me into the the bigger parts of the industry too. Which so it's kind of cool. <laughs> that, that is nice. Uh, small world. It's so it kind of yeah. leads me to want to ask, what is it that, you know, atomic distribution and then you went, uh, I, I think from there to work for Delano's. Is that right? Yeah. So Delano's Delano's was essentially like um, owner and founder of Atomic. Um, they used it as a distribution company for their um, for their customers also. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it was um, it was kind of a at, at one point after they'd grown to a certain point, they kind of as, assumed the company under the Delano's moniker. So it all became one company, one entity after about five or six years of work in there. So um, but but yeah, it, it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, getting to know that side of the industry, getting to know, we also were, um, equipment sales and, and stuff. So I got to know a ton about, um, espresso machines and, and equipment sales, as well as just every syrup and sauce you could imagine, uh, cup manufacturers, <laughs> um, all that stuff. And then as, a, as we kind of m- melded in with Delano's, um, um, I got to know everything about coffee and, and get super involved that way. So 
is that where you decided that you wanted to uh, start coffee as a career? Was there a moment where you thought, well, um, this is it? You know, for me, it was really just seeing um, the excitement of of building and growing business, um, working directly with people like, um, I mean, David Morris is an awesome entrepreneurial guy. He was a, um, you know, pretty self-starter guy, um, you know, high school dropout, but, but made this big business out of, out of just kind of his drive and passion was big into like Tony Robbins and stuff like that, which for me, I'm a motivational kind of guy as well. And always Mm -hmm. the power of, you know, just believing what you can do. Um, you know, really spoke to me and I got caught up in that, uh, and because I think I'm wired the same way. So, um, I think I was more inspired by the idea of entrepreneurial, um, living, um, of, of being somebody who grows and develops ideas into real things. And, um, and coffee was just this really cool medium where, you know, relationship and communication just naturally happened. It was just very comfortable for me. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't think there was ever really a point where I'm like, oh, it's a career. I just kind of got caught up in it and just kept on swimming downstream. Um, nice. So um, you're fascinated by yeah. everything going on and, and you just kept on wanting to dig and find out what, what more there was. Right. And that was what was really cool uh, for me as I got into it. It just seemed like there was just this unlimited resource of knowledge, too. I mean, as I, you know, working with Delano's, got to the point where I was digging more and more into working with barista guild and became the Northwest regional, uh, chapter rep for barista guild of America. And, um, you know, started getting really involved in teaching at barista camp and, um, judging for barista competitions. And, and was at that time, I think I was, you know, running the latte art competition for coffee fest Mm -hmm. and just really taking any opportunity I could to get around whoever was doing the best in the industry around me, you know, and, and trying to learn and trying to be involved, uh, with all that. And, and, um, and I realized soon, I'm like, well, geez, I need to, I need to do more with this. And, and, uh, and then opportunity came up, um, after about 10 years at Delano's to, uh, to open my own shop. And, and that was kind of a no brainer. So, um, in 2001, my wife and I, and, and a partner opened, um, Metronome coffee, which is our, our retail store we have today. We open seven years this January. Oh, wow. Congratulations. How, how has that, how did that come together in, in the sense like 10 years working for, uh, you know, Delano's and then taking in all of the information in the industry? Um, obviously, like you said earlier, you had an entrepreneurial bent. Was this something that you were kind of angling for during those 10 years? I, not, not really, but I've, I've always been somebody really aware of, um, of what works. I mean, obviously, I got the benefit of 10 years of watching, um, you know, essentially wholesale customers fighting through profitability, fighting through differentiating themselves in the market, um, good brands, bad brands, good design, bad design, um, all of these different elements that go into being components of whether a business will survive or, or thrive, you know, and, and uh, I really was able to kind of essentially <laughs> skim the cream off of the the top of, of all these ideas in some ways, um, as well as melding in obviously what kind of drives me personally, um, to create a space, I think that encapsulates, um, you know, the best of what the industry is about. And, and metronome has always been about, um, creating a space where people get to know the rhythm of their own heart. If they're busy in life, it's a time to slow the tempo down. If they're feeling discouraged and, and maybe a little bit, um, you know, way down, it's a time, it's a place to pick you up and bring a little bit more pep to your steps. So, um, it's really about going to the deeper places of everything. And, mm. and, um, I think that's what's brought, um, a lot of success for us in our community. And, um, that engagement factor really is what's bringing, I think, our growth too. So we're, we're just, we just announced we're opening a second location on the east side of Tacoma, um, which is a kind of a, you know, a developing neighborhood in Tacoma, a lot of, um, in historically lower income, et cetera. But, uh, the, met- the Metro parks in Tacoma approached us, um, to partner with them in this 30 th- or $30 million, uh, community, uh, center that they're building because of our involvement and our connection to people. And so, um, you know, that's, that's been a great door we've been able to walk through because of a connection to mission and our, our commitment to being, uh, who we are. In, in a specific place, uh, no matter what the cost. So yeah. I love the, the idea, the metronome connection to the rhythm of your own heart and the, mm-hmm. how coffee shops are so central to the life, especially in the Pacific Northwest, but just in general, that third place does really, uh, allow people to explore that part of them that they're, they might not 
want, have opportunity to explore in their their home necessarily or their their uh, work. So you you now are getting ready to open a second location, but when you open the first one, was that was that a real leap of faith for you? You it was a pretty secure job going from that to starting your own business. Uh, you personally had not tested these ideas. You'd seen them other people do it, but there must have been some trepidation there. Uh, there definitely was. And um, like one of my friends so wisely stated to me, um, not actually fairly recently, sometimes when you get comfortable, um, it takes a little bit of uncomfortability to get you uh, where you need to go. Mm. Um, and, and, and fortunately, you know, um, through this process of, of learning and growing everything in the industry, um, you know, it, it had created some conflict in what was kind of an established business in Delano's and where I saw my career going and my my desire for knowledge and growth. And so um, so there was a bit of parting ways that kind of happened naturally. Um, I'd, I'd had the shop open for about three or four months, but in one becoming, you know, the owner of my own business and, you know, being very self-directed and knowing what it takes to run that as well as working for another company, um, it, it was a very, there's a lot of conflict there. There's a lot of tension in being managed by someone, but also being self-managed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I don't know if there's any other people out there that are working in many capacities throughout the industry or working for some people and doing some little bit of side hustle, whatever it is like there's, there's conflict there, you know, the difference of b- building your dream and building someone else's dream. And, um, and I think I see, we see a lot of that in this industry, why there is such a great growth uh, an influx of new retail stores and new micro roasters is because people want to see their um, their heart expressed in a unique way through some um, through some environment within this industry. And and li- unlike many other industries, um, you've got an opportunity to do that. You can be successful, um, which I think is great. It's just very fertile soil for unique perspectives to grow and, and develop. I mean, look at um, you know, narrative copy that I know you had on recently, mm-hmm. um, see what Maxwell has done. I mean, like he is, uh, is an amazing guy, past competitor, awesome drive, great vision and mission now has his own place. You know, um, uh, you just see that happening all the time. It's like seeds, seeds that just, um, can't help but be fruitful, uh, if they're near fertile soil. Unfortunately, this industry is that. So they just, they just start to sprout and they're like, well, geez, I guess I got to just run with this thing, you know? And, uh, <laughs> So anyways, that's kind of how it happened for, for me is there was that tension, you know, and, and, and you're right. I mean, there was the first year of us being open, um, you know, where it was a hard year and, uh, actually working in the shop and running things for myself, there was a lot we learned, um, you know, you know like you said, from the, the conceptual of watching other people and, and doing things versus the actual of, you know, getting the grounds under my own fingernails, uh, and doing it. Um, there was a lot, a lot that I learned through that process, but, um, but I think we gained a lot from it. I actually did a very short stint out of the coffee industry after our first year open. Um, uh, my family, we'd run out of money and, and I did a short stint working in uh, advertising sales for Zillow, um, working 14 hour days up in Seattle. It was just brutal. But um, yeah, it definitely made me appreciate the coffee industry. What it, Would you say that that was one of the biggest challenges you had during that time? I think so. Um, I, it was It was very challenging. So so when we opened Metronome, we got approached by um, an investor who owned a building that a cafe space had been in prior. He knew my background in coffee. He knew my kind of background in consulting and stuff and um, approached us to, to essentially put a coffee shop in as equal partners with our intellectual property and sweat equity. And he was willing to essentially kind of like feed this company until we got it profitable, um, which, which is a very nerve wracking feeling, um, you know, to be in a position where um, where essentially, um, you've got somebody spending out of their own pocket to fund your business. That's supposed to be making money, you know, which is, mm-hmm. it's a weird thing. It's a weird feeling to get that. And, and anybody that's been in retail knows that, you know, average for a retail store to, to gain profitability is three to five years yeah. if they even can survive that long. And, uh, and a lot of people I think get into the business, not really anticipating that kind of tension of, of the daily ongoing expenses of labor and cost of goods and cost of occupancy, it just doesn't, um, it just doesn't work. So, um, so, so that's really been something through learning that and the tension of that, that, um, you know, fortunately for me, um, getting in a position where, um, I was able to step away and, and get a job and, and, you know, essentially not draw, we, we not draw any income from our space, but also 
you know, be vested in it the way our partner was and um, be in a position where we're not, you know, we're, you know, we're not taking while he's giving in. We both have equal kind of like um, we both have equal, you know, sweat in the game. So so that helped, you know, working at this place and working at Zillow and getting another income and, and kind of doing that. So that 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 was really good. And we've had an opportunity to really then uh, make things happen and, and grow to where we needed to. So you open Metronome and the goal is to, you know, your mission is to provide this space uh, in your name to have people find the rhythm of their own heart. So uh, it, it seems like the people that work in the coffee bar, it, it's a lot of hard work to be able to provide something that's harder to actually partake in yourself. Um, was there a, a kind of searching of the soul as you went through this, like looking at what you were doing and the mission of it and, and providing other people with this this uh, product and this experience? Describe the tension between your experience of providing that versus what you were experiencing in operating it. You know, I, I felt fulfilled. I mean, I really did. I mean, the mission was was always something that was birthed out of what I believe. I mean, um, this concept of of knowing the rhythm of your own heart really ties into my own personal life philosophy that um, if you are living out of your heart's truest rhythm, um, you know, not not fighting against everything, but really just letting your heart beat in the rhythm as it was created, um, you'll find peace and you'll find balance, um, you know, with everybody and everything around you. I mean, time is the unavoidable factor that we are all in, um, in the midst of time, you know, we can't avoid it. Mm -hmm. You know, seasons change, trees grow, you know, things live and die. And if we can settle into the idea that I, I am part of this big symphony going on around me, there's a, there's a meter to this music, and, um, I'm not meant to be a competing melody with everything, but I'm meant to be in harmony. Mm-hmm. I'm meant to find my spot, my chair, my instrument to bring more beauty to that space. Then, um, then, then, then really, um, you know, the beauty of that music can fill every, every space you're in, uh, with that kind of intention. So, so for me, you know, working in the shop and being a part of this, like was, was a dream. It was really great. But, but the reality, the tension of all that is like, you know, there are, you know, the need for resources, you know, I had a family to, to support and, and that side of it. And so how to balance those things out, um, is really difficult to do sometimes, but, um, I still hold true to the fact that I believe, um, doing what you were made to do and doing what you love will always bring the byproduct of financial freedom. Eventually, Mm -hmm. if you just pursue money, like you probably are going to fall short, but if you pursue what you believe and you pursue what you know is right, then, then money will always follow. And, uh, and, and now we're at a great spot. Um, you know, things are, things are going really well for us and, and, and we've kind of worked through the, the, uh, the obstacles, but I think you have to know going into stuff that opposition is going to come. And the only thing that helps you push through opposition is, is authority is, is knowing that you are doing it for the right reasons and you're committed to it. And I think that's what a lot of people that, um, will, you know, hit a hit opposition and fall or hit opposition and close is the idea that they don't have the authority to say, yes, I'm made to do this. This is what I'm supposed to be doing in my life right now. And, and without it, they come up against opposition. They say, well, oh, maybe I wasn't supposed to, instead mm-hmm. of saying, Hey, this is an obstacle to push through. So, so that was a big difference for us was knowing that this is what we were made to do and, uh, and just push through. So this vision and this shop runs, uh, as a group project, you have a lot of staff that work for Metronome yeah. and, uh, how many staff, uh, have, do you have right now? Um, we have about nine employees right now. Um, store manager also, um, um, obviously we're going to be hiring some more as we look into the, the new space. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but we're, are, we're really enjoying, uh, a lot of our staff we've had since, since we first opened, we don't have a lot of turnover. Um, nice. we want to invest in our people and give them an opportunity to, to grow with us. So, um, we've got some baristas we've taken with us to coffee shows, compete in competitions, um, you know, travel around with us a little bit, go to coffee events. Um, you know, our, one of the gals who was our, one of our original baristas is now our store manager. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, our goal is that, um, you know, and I really believe this with a company that has a great mission, if you can, if your mission is big enough, um, you should be able to to give people opportunity that work with you to adopt that mission as their own or see their personal mission fulfilled within yours. Mm-hmm. And so um, so we release a lot of our people to do what they love within the business, too. So 
Um, we make all of our syrups and sauces in house. We just do some seasonal, um, uh, rotating syrups, just a few, but really great stuff. Um, all natural ingredients. Um, but, but one of our gals that loves to cook, she, she makes all those in house. Um, and so she's getting to do part of what she loves in our space and it makes it even better. You know, nice. um, we've nice. got a couple of our guys really into microbrewery and they, they're in charge of selecting our beer and wine. Um, mm-hmm. they work directly with the distributors and stuff on that. So, um, so giving people opportunity to own portions of our business as if it was their own, instead of me, you know, fragmenting myself, I'm, I'm actually releasing them to take ownership and, um, and then fulfill, um, you know, you know, their, their sort of life mission, um, through, through the business and it, and it benefits us also. Sure. So over the years, you've, you've seen many different owners through your, you know, work with Delanos and through the industry, um, uh, making good choices and then making bad choices in staff. And it's not like there's bad people. It's just not the right fit. Um, how do you go about finding the right people for your store? What does the hiring uh, process look like? What's, what's the goal when you're, when you're doing that? Um, I mean, the goal, the goal is always um, finding someone who has, you know, again, the right heart. Um, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that believes you can teach most anybody coffee, you can't teach everybody friendly. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Amen. I, I, I think, I think it seems like a no brainer, but I mean, we're in a people industry and we serve a specialty product and, you know, we can geek out on to the nth degree on, on everything in coffee. And I've kind of come full circle in my perspective of coffee. Um, even just in my last, you know, sort of season, um, in coffee working, uh, with Victrola, um, where, coffee has gone from something where it was, you know, my first iterations in my career was like lots of flavor and lots of large milk based beverages to me getting into the, don't you dare put cream and sugar in my coffee to now where it's like, I understand that coffee is an accoutrement to an experience. It's a, it is a part of someone's lifestyle. It's a part of somebody's day. And, um, I want them to have the best experience they can have and serve them in a way where this coffee does nothing but enhance that. And, um, and, and bring an open door for exploration and adventure for them, but no, don't make them obligated to come into my world, um, in order for them to have a great experience. So, so that's really what we look for employees is, is that sort of like, um, level of interest in individuals, le- level of care, level of ability to serve, um, you know, uh, compassionate, um, you know, interactive type people. And then, and then coffee skill we can train. Is, is there a application process that's unique to your company that uh, helps you sort of sift through the applicants to find that? Or is this more of a, a, a gut feeling you get during the interview? To be honest, um, in, the, in the early days, we really wanted to maintain the group interview scenario because we really gained a lot from um, you know learning. It's not about what people say, but it's what uh, the people engaging the other people say, you know, I mean, like, uh, this was something that was adopted by, I want to, I want to say it was Southwest airlines, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, low, one of the lowest rated, um, customer service airlines in the industry. And they stopped doing ind- individual interviews. They, they went to uh, group interviews and they would, you know, bring people into this room and they'd give them, you know, a minute or two to prepare. They say, Hey, we're going to have each of you present a little bit about yourself and why you think you deserve this job. And, They'd each one at a time, let them come up to the microphone or whatever and, and share a little bit about their story and why they wanted that job. And, um, the people that are orchestrating this interview are literally barely, you know, giving notice to the person that's giving the presentation. They're watching the other people in the audience who's engaging the speaker, who's looking and, and interested in their story and, and looking and nodding and smiling and engaging what they're presenting. Versus, you know, scribbling notes about what they're going to say and focused on themselves. And those are the people they hired. And in the end, their, 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 uh, their customer service rating skyrocketed. And, um, that was always an amazing idea for me to be, um, to be more aware of, of, um, cultivating natural giftings in connectivity in people and, and, and those sort of like levels of care and compassion and connection that I think are just, um, are just what some people are privy to. And, and others really just don't have a, uh, don't have a, a reason to be in, in service industry without it. So uh, that sounds like the same thing. It's probably the exact same thing that Maxwell has done with narrative. He, he mentioned the group interview 
uh, using that model too. So this is the second time on the show. So everyone listening, I do have a sounds like a though. good, uh, <laughs> sounds like a good model, but what, is, what is the caveat? Okay. So, so, and now, but the interesting thing is now is that we, we hired so well, we don't lose anybody. And so the idea of, of having an opportunity to, to hire in a group or, or have an opportunity for more than maybe one position to be open is pretty rare. So, um, we've actually seen a lot of, um, our employees modeling so much of the mission of our business to customers that we've actually hired. The last few of our baristas have been past customers. They've been people that have actually gotten, um, inundated with the, the, the environment and the, uh, the ideology of the business so much that they literally want to join, um, mm. which is really cool, nice. um, to have this natural sort of infusion of, of, of what we're doing. And it's so inspiring that people want to just be around it all the time. And, uh, and it's been really amazing to see that kind of organically happen. I can't take credit for it, honestly. Um, but it really is just the environment and the, and the community that we've developed in this space that people just want to be there all the time. And, and, and you can feel it when you come in, um, you know, and so, so that's, that's a unique thing is really, you know, let there be open doors as you like, like if, if you really have a space where, um, you're looking for opportunity, opportunity to invite your customers into knowing more about what your business is and how it runs and the deeper things of the industry. Don't be surprised if someone gets so inspired that they want to join your team. Um, and, and I think that's what we've seen happen. That's awesome. Such a virtuous cycle having that kind of a, uh, ecosystem in your, in your uh, cafe. So as the years went on seven years now, what is it that you have done to maintain and nurture that? What is it that you as an owner engage in on a, on a daily basis or a weekly basis, the, the kind of habits that you have that you can say, these are instrumental in helping this be uh, maintained? You know, for me, a big part is my personal pursuit. Um, I really believe that a lot of what has created this or organic environment in this place um, comes out of me being my truest self, because that's what's so beautiful about the idea of the metronome. I don't know if you've ever watched these videos of on YouTube. They've got the suspended of uh, a platform and they've got a hundred metronomes on it. And, you know, they put them in all different, um, all different times of starting and, and they're all set to the same meter, but they start at different times and, and slowly, but surely you watch all of these metronomes slowly drop into sync. Hmm. And, and, um, I really believe that it is my responsibility to be in constant pursuit, not only in my own personal career in the industry, but as an individual, as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as, you know, as anyone, you know, that, that I, that I'm being the best that I can be and, and willing to learn from every environment, mm -hmm. um, and, and take those opportunities to, to bring that to, to my team. And so, um, there's a lot of vulnerability in my team. There's a lot of, um, a lot of people sharing what they're going through. Um, you know, we, we share meals together, we share time together, you know, we, we spend as much time as we can, um, you know, cultivating real relationship and, and not being afraid of, um, not being afraid of what's real, you know, uh, because we're real people. We deal with real people, um, as customers as well as employees and, and, and ownership. And so, um, you know, for me, that's key for me, it's key that my commitment lies, lies there. And then, then the engagements are, are more natural. It's like, nobody wants to feel like it's like, okay, employee, uh, Let's have a sit down employee owner uh, conversation. And here's my checklist of things to talk about. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you tell me how this is going and let me review your your sales per hour and et cetera. You know, so it's you don't want it to feel contrived. These should be people that you, you know and love and care about. And the way you model that love and care for them is literally showing them how to love your customers. Well, the, the, uh, we have a different attitude of customer service at, at Metronome. And, and I've come to like really bring this to a lot of wherever I go. Customer service is not the good that you bring to somebody. It's not like the dog and pony show of like, hey, customer service is really more the good you draw out of people. Mm. It, everyone wants to be around that person where you feel like you're the best version of yourself around them. And so our goal not as owners to our employees, is our goal is to help them become who they were made to be truly 
and, and let them find the rhythm of their own heart and let them become who they were made to be. Sometimes that's at metronome. Sometimes we're helping them get where they're supposed to go. That's not at metronome. But ultimately, as an individual, we're committed to them. And so our employees now live that way. And they model that in, in the way they interact with our, with our customers. They care about their day. They care about what they're really going through. And they want to draw out what's good inside of them. They want to encourage. They want to support. And, um, and, and I do believe that, is, uh, that has been the factor that has differentiated a lot of us, uh, in, uh, of, of our success versus even others in, in, in our surrounding area. So all of that in, in I, I feel like that is an incredible point about bringing out the best in other people and sort of getting them to see the their own significance in spite of their day and in spite of what's going on in their lives uh, that you can see in them something that maybe they don't even see in themselves until you know they'd be a customer at your shop. Um, it, it all sounds really great, but I, I want to sort of dive into the idea that a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people feel the draw to the opposite. And I wonder, in your opinion, mm -hmm. what would inspire an owner to withhold themselves from that kind of, you know, that personal pursuit, that organic relational yeah. approach to business? What's behind saying, no, no, um, that's not for me? That's a great question. Um, you know, I've always looked at, at there being two sides to the coin of, of, of how people pursue I remember I talked a little bit earlier, the, the deficit I think a lot of business owners have is the idea of authority. And authority really is the ability to say, um, I've looked back at my life. I've looked um, at myself. I've looked at my own heart. I've looked at why I'm even in this business. And I know, I know what that thing is, the why I wake up in the morning, the why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's established. There is no unknown behind me. And so knowing where I've been, I can know where I need to go. Um, for those people that have not done that, that have not really solidified in their mind and their heart and their very being that they're doing something for uh, for a bigger purpose connected to their identity, there that element of of unknown is is uh, is fear. You know, they they've got fear established in that unknown, and so I think the direct opposite of that is is hope in the un unknown. You either have fear in the unknown or you have hope in the unknown. And it's, it's essentially like fear versus faith. Faith is believing in the things that you don't see, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I really believe that that is the, the big differentiator for those people that aren't in this position where they're like, I can't let my employees know about me personally, or I can't get involved and connected with them personally. I can't, um, cross over the boundaries of real life. All those things is because there is that unknown. There's fear of the unknown. But once you establish what role you have to play, then it's really more understanding how do I get into harmony with the other people around me? Because I, I have confidence. I'm, I don't need to change me for them. I be me, and I and and that and that's consistent. Um, you know. So another another analogy I like to use, and hopefully I'm not getting too obscure with my references. I work in metaphors, and it's the only way things make sense I love for it. me. Go for it. Um, so I, I I use this analogy is that I I imagine a great business is like a campfire. And every person, every individual in their life has their own log of, of understanding, of truth, their identity, um, all the things that make up who they are. And year by year, just like a, a tree grows, those layers are built. And in, in a business, you can take that log, essentially, and you can either hide it and protect it and think that that's your one commodity or you can bring that log to the fire and, and in the pursuit of synergy and in the pursuit of, of, of fire and, and communication and, and the possibility of change. Um, and that's, that's really where I think the hope comes in, the hope of the unknown, because it takes you faith to take what you know and what you believe and throw it on the fire. But the best part is this, is that if you make space in community with other people, for an opportunity for, for truth to reveal itself, it always will. The only thing that's burned away is everything that's fake, everything that doesn't really m matter for you in your life. And what you're left with is more refined, you know, burning passion. And, and um, if you can create an environment as a business owner where you are welcoming others to the campfire, say, look, I know you've got experience. I know you've got life. I know you have history. All of those things that brought you here right now. And if I can model for you 
what it looks like to to lay down my life on this fire and welcome you to say, hey, you know, if something you have to say or something, you know, changes my perspective on how I do business, I'm willing to learn from you because I don't have a static log. I have a burning fire here. It changes constantly as people add and fuel it with their ideas, their passion, their perspectives, their insight. I'm not afraid, but I am going to have something that's blazing and, and full of energy, not static. And so you model that. Mm. And, and you welcome other people to bring what they know and what they believe of not only themselves, but of your business, their perspective. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had my employees come up with way better ideas than I've ever thought of for my shop. And we implement it because they're working at it. They're looking at it from different perspectives. What makes a diamond brilliant? Many facets, lots of perspectives. We need people that are constantly in a position where they feel uh, able to be vulnerable, able to express ideas, able to pour their real life and, and thoughts out and, and not get burned, but truly see themselves refined. That's where, where, where people will begin to flourish. That's where we'll begin to see themselves um, um, loved and valued. And you'll see the byproduct of, of amazing uh, growth in your business because that energy pervades all that you do. Man, Josh, you're on fire. <laughs> is that a pun <laughs> yeah well, it's not a very good one but the seriously uh, though this that was amazing i uh, i want to ask though what are some what are some practical steps now listening to this if i'm inspired if i'm an owner that is inspired to say you know what maybe i am holding the cards too close to the vest maybe i am withholding the relational aspect of 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 business because out of fear of of insecurity of my authority or fear of um you know losing a part of you know yeah. whatever it is what do i do practically this yeah. week and next week to be able to make some steps in that direction this goes a little bit back into my story of what what's been going with me in my career so in my in my time um working with metronome and seeing these things happen. And I, I opened this, this business called tuning for consulting, where the whole idea of that is, is um, creating businesses that resonate with their customers. And, and I really think that that idea of having something that has that energy, the same as the campfire that is humming with truth um, and, and this great identity and drive um, wants to be in a position where when it gets in proximity to other people, that have a need for that or in, are, are attuned to that, that every atom in their being begins to excite. The same way a tuning fork set to a specific tone or frequency will excite every atom of anything in proximity to it in that same frequency. Um, so that's that's the idea is really, we've I, I've worked in this idea of how do I get people to understand um, this concept of, of how do I be a real manager, be a real owner, and a lot of it begins in, in looking with your, at yourself, looking, looking backwards to look forward, looking inward to understand what's going on outside of you. And, um, and I, I teach a seminar three times a year at Coffee Fest, uh, a business and brand tune up where literally I go, go through the steps of, um, developing a personal mission and developing that into a business mission, mission statement, core values and developing a whole business off of that. Um, but it's all rooted in the foundation of you knowing yourself. And um, uh, if you guys want to check that out, go to my website, tuningforconsulting.com. The Resonate tab has that whole video of that seminar. It's about 45 minutes. Um, watch it. And, and, and I go into a little bit of that kind of like digging into your own past and your own identity to, to begin to rethink and reimagine your business based off the stable ground that is who you are. Um, you know, because your path that you've been on has made you a tool fit for a specific purpose. And you have to know that that's the unique factor you have to all competition. No other person in their business has you. No other person has your life experience or your, your victories and failures that have carved for you the key to unlock the, the people that need to know, uh, you know what you're about and will engage your business. So um, to answer your question simply, they need to look in. They need to look at themselves. They need to take the time to, to listen to their heart. Get quiet. Don't listen to the bills. Don't listen to the, to the profit margins. Don't listen to any of that stuff. Get to know yourself first. And then out of that, start to start to, you know, build that campfire mentality. Welcome people in, you know, your employees, your customers. Start creating environments where, where you can uh, know and be known. Because ultimately that's the desire of every person's heart. Mm. So if they do listen to the bills, if they do listen to all the voices around them, I mean, what's at risk here? If they decide, well, I don't wanna 
I don't know. That sounds kind of woo woo to me. I'm going to yeah. uh, continue to do what I'm doing, but maybe change tactics and, you, and not necessarily change the core. You'll fail. That's the bottom line. Your business will close. Maybe not today and maybe not in a month, but the reason why is because you are living fragmented. You're living focused on minutia. You're grasping at straws. You're holding sand in your hand. There is nothing of substance in, in the why of your business. Simon Sinek, great, great book. Start with why. If you know that you are doing this, um, this cafe or whatever it may be based off of who you are, it doesn't matter how, if you're tired that day. It doesn't matter if the bills seem high or the income seems low or the baristas are being crabby. Whatever it is, if you know you're supposed to be there, it, you, you'll be able to push through, you know, because it's based on who you are, not just what you do. It's your identity. And, and that's, that's a key factor. Um, you know, if you focus on the details, you're, you're swatting it flies. You really are just focused on these, these distractions instead of the core root issue, which is, um, which is ultimately the heart of every business. If you are being somebody great and you're doing great things, uh, people want to be around you. People love doing business with friends. And there's so many options for great coffee now. It used to be back in the, remember this, Chris, back in the day, it's like, who is doing a good job with pour over or who's serving the amazing, you know, lighter roasted, you know, uh, micro lot of coffee. Like you could go some places and coffee was bad. Some places is good. Like good coffee is square one these days. Mm -hmm. You're not making good coffee. You're not even a, a part of the conversation. But what differentiates the people that succeed now are people that are creating environments that are honest and, and full of integrity and full of passion and full of power and drive and perspective and, and, and people that, that believe in something bigger than just the product they're serving. They believe that they're part of something bigger. And, and that value is expressed because this is the underlying message of, of specialty coffee, that, that someone can receive a, a marketable good that has had care invested into it for months, if not years, and they literally get to buy it and consume that and it becomes part of who they are. And that intention of investment is no different in your business. That, that, that supply chain can break down anywhere along the way, you know? So, so we've got to be committed to, to doing more and, and, and being better and, and, uh, and, and committing to being who we are. Joshua, this has been incredible and inspirational and I'm, I'm super excited, uh, for all the, the metaphors and the, you know, the wisdom that you've shared here. How can folks get in touch with you? Where can they find out more about metronome and tuning fork and, uh, yeah. Etc. Yeah, it's been great. Um, check out our websites, metronomecoffee.com, uh, tuningforkconsulting.com. You can email me um, at, at either one of those. It's just Joshua B at metronomecoffee.com or Joshua at tuningforkconsulting.com. I'd love to talk to anybody. My cell phone's 253 677 3793. I'm available all the time. Um, <laughs> this is what I love. I'm doing what I was made to do, and I want to challenge you guys to do the same. You know, one of the main things that I came away from this conversation with Joshua with is a renewed sense that it is okay to step back and take a look at my own heart, to take a look at why I'm doing what I'm doing. Of course, he mentioned Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. But, you know, Simon Sinek's book and uh, Joshua's advice to entrepreneurs and owners really applies to anybody in the industry because we all start to order our steps based on the demands of the things that we attract to us. The Even the last week or two, I have personally been looking at what I do as an operations manager and realizing that so much of it is dependent upon other people asking me to do things and how not much of that time is spent really creating momentum forward, but reacting to momentum put on me. And th the way I translate what Joshua is saying is, if you're an owner, you have opened a business see, you know, for a reason, and you want to explore the most honest and true expression of yourself through that business, or else you probably wouldn't have opened a business and one of the best things that you can do is uh, know your own heart, know the rhythm of your heart, which is why he chose Metronome Coffee as the name for his coffee bar. The, the metaphor that Joshua used with the log and putting that log on a fire with other logs and, and kind of burning together more brightly, 
it, it really hits home with me because you know when you're working collectively as a group on the bar doing uh, different parts of the business in the office, in the uh, kitchen, on the bar, everyone from the accountant to the barista are all putting their log on that fire and making it burn brighter and brighter. And one of the things that will probably leave you cold is if you just try to do it by yourself. If you don't involve other people or you don't uh, invite vulnerability as a value in your company, then it's it's only a matter of time until the uh, fakeness of, of what you have to kind of put on every day catches up with you. And according to Joshua, the consequence of, of not having that uh, value of, of vulnerability and knowing yourself and knowing your, your driving purpose and vision and the rhythm of your own heart is the death of your business. So I would highly encourage you to go to Tuning Fork Consulting, uh, click on the Resonate tab on the website, and listen to Joshua's seminar on brands and business tune-up. Uh, you will not be sorry that you did, and I think it will probably go a long way to doing just that for you and put you in the direction of, of tuning up your business. And as, as healthy as you are, that's how healthy you can expect your staff to be. So you, you can start to look for that in other people. So take that first step. Look within to find your why. Uh, discover what it is that you really want to do with this business and, and what the true purpose and, and rhythm of your heart is in your business. So for me, I feel like those are some of the main takeaways from what Joshua said, and there was a lot discussed in this conversation. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to it again. And um, I always think that it's helpful to take notes on on things. And I know we're not in school anymore. Maybe some of you are. Um, for those of us who aren't in school anymore, you need to realize that if you write it down and you put it to paper or to computer, it doesn't matter, it's more likely to stick with you. So all of the things that have been shared in the Keys to the Shop episodes, uh, getting close to 60 episodes now, if you write these things down, they're really going to make a difference more so than if you have a notion that um, this is really good. I'm going to have to remember that. Well, we all know that life happens and we can be really forgetful uh, at times because of what happens in life. So when you put it on paper, you can come back to it and remember it. Of course, you can find the show notes for this episode over at keystotheshop.com. Uh, that is what that's for, um, where the main points of the episode are put down in a PDF form. And all of the past episodes also are available on the episodes tab. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, it's chris at keystotheshop.com. If you have any questions, comments, or, or if you have any suggestions for ways that we can make this show more valuable to you in your career, I am all ears. I definitely uh, recognize this show as an ongoing project, and I hope to be doing this for a very long time. So thank you for that. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe and uh, leave a comment or review on iTunes. That would mean so much. So my thanks to Joshua for coming on the show, sharing his heart and giving us some inspirational things to think about and apply in our careers, to give our careers momentum and direction. Uh, thank you so much, Joshua. Now, I hope you all have an amazing week. Stay tuned. Next Tuesday, we have an episode coming up that is a really great one. It's an interview with Hannah Neuschwander, the communications director of World Coffee Research. We're talking about coffee plant science and agronomy. We're talking about uh, retail coffee and how the two have evolved next to each other, how they've influenced one another, and how we can better communicate between these two bookends of the coffee industry. Uh, it's a fascinating interview. I really encourage you to stay tuned for that uh, episode 60 of Keys to the Shop. A great way to bring in the big 6-0. So uh, anyway, we'll see you on Tuesday. And I hope that this episode, as always, has given you keys to the shop.